Remember Toad from American Graffiti? The actor who played that memorable role became a familiar face on dozens of movies and TV shows, as well as an accomplished director. Hear about his new movie and his family's incredible connection to classic animation on this week's episode of Brio TV, the podcast. My guest today was among a great cast of future stars, including Ron Howard, Cindy Williams, Richard Dreyfuss, and Harrison Ford, in George Lucas's 1973 hit, American Graffiti. He went on to play memorable roles in The Untouchables, The Buddy Holly Story, and Starman, as well as several projects in Canada, including Never Cry Wolf. He also made an adventurous little Disney film from the 70s that I happen to have a 16 millimeter print of called No Deposit, No Return. On no other podcast will you hear so much about this crazy little film, which co-starred David Niven, Darren McGavin, Barbara Feldon, Don Knotts, Herschel Bernardi, and many others. He's also directed several films, including Air Bud, Dolphin Tail, and another project with the great Canadian author, Farley Mowat, titled The Snow Walker. Beyond all that, his dad and uncles were among the top animators and animation directors of Hollywood's Golden Age. You can see him now as a cranky geezer who escorts a runaway teen on a cross-country trek in director Robert Vaughn's latest feature, This Time. This very today road picture can be streamed on demand now on Super Channel. My guest has so many stories and worked with so many famous film and TV stars. My back got sore picking up all the names that were dropped. Please welcome Mr. Charles Martin Smith. Very happy you made time for this, Charles. I appreciate it. I I have lots to talk to you about, really fascinated by your career and want to talk about this time, especially. And let's get this out of the way. I have a poster behind me. Oh, yeah. I noticed that. Yeah. And um, you might, who the hell has a poster of No Deposit, No Return? I collect 16 millimeter film. And um, at one point, I came across a print a pretty good print on 16 of the film. And I showed it to my kids when they were growing up and they loved it, you know? So um, I, I, I get a kick out of this film. (laughs) It's like so many stars in the movie, right? It's pretty cool. David Niven. Yeah. It's an interesting cat. Yeah. I remember that. Uh, Particularly David Niven. I mean, there's a Hollywood legend and uh, probably one of the few actors still walking around that worked with him. Uh, and he well, was a real gentleman. He was a lovely guy, and uh, he, he he seemed like he would have been. He was a good sport too. At the very end, he like literally sits in a fountain, right? Yes, <laughs> he had a couple of days. I don't know how old he was. He must have been in his late seventies. He had a couple of days where he just announced to the director he was done and he was going home and thank you very much. We should all go home now. <laughs> he, was, he said, I'm, you know, basically I'm too old for this, but uh, no, he was a good sport and he loved to tell stories. Oh, great. Was a wonderful storyteller. He, uh, and you know, his, I don't know if you've read his books, the moon's a balloon. The moon's a balloon. I read many, many years ago, very candid book for its time. Right. And beautifully written, and he didn't yeah. use a ghostwriter. I mean, he could. Yeah. Really write. And his other, his next book was uh, "Bring on the Empty Horses," which was right. another. It was also, uh, but he he spoke as eloquently as he wrote. But yeah, it was a fun movie. I was impressed with a couple of people in it because I was only I don't know nineteen or something. Well, it's uh, it's nineteen seventy five or six, I think, and uh, yeah, Herschel Bernardi and uh, Barbara Feldon, people remember from Get Smart. Uh, Vic Tabak from Alice plays a heavy. Vic uh, uh, heavies. Don Knotts yeah. and Barry McGavin and uh, yeah, my goodness, I mean, what a cast! It was a great cast. I, I became good friends with Herschel Bernardi. We did a couple of things together. Wow. And, Herschel, I had never been to New York, and I flew out there while he was shooting. Ah, oh, that thing with Woody Allen, um, the front. That oh, was, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, communist witch hunts and writers. Blacklist. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Blacklist. And, and uh, 
he was shooting that in New York. So I flew to New York and I had a couple of meetings set up, but he showed me around. He was like the king of New York. He was a lovely guy. We became good friends. And then he died very suddenly, very young. Oh, that's a shame. Well, I remember him going back to Arnie, a sitcom yeah. that was on uh, just earlier than that, even, and uh, always uh, a very solid actor. Um, he, let, he was the, um, when they did The Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. Wow. The part was originated by Zero Mostel, uh, which I think people know. You know he played yeah. the Tevia. But when, when he left the show, Herschel Bernardi came in and actually got better reviews than Zero Mostel. Wow. So one of the things that Herschel was really known for was playing Tevia and Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. You, your career, you, you just seem to intersect with all of these fascinating actors, really yeah. iconic people. And, uh, uh, good for you. And um, let, let's start to and, and talk a bit about This Time, which is a movie that uh, folks can see now on Super Channel. It's yeah. on demand and it's uh, scheduled on Super Channel Fuse. Um, and this is directed by a fellow named uh, Robert Vaughn. And I understand you guys go back a bit, know each other. Uh, I, I talked to Robert a couple of years ago when he, he did another film. Um, how, how do you guys know each other? We met in the late 90s, I guess. Uh, I uh, was developing a film with the company that he worked for. I was developing a script to direct. Mm -hmm. And he was the young creative executive guy at that company. He must have been in his mid-20s, I guess. I'm not really sure how old he was. But anyway, we... Um, we got together just, you know, because he was the executive that was kind of supervising the development of this script. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we'd go out for lunches and stuff and just really hit it off and became great friends. That movie never got made, but the friendship endures. Wow. No, it's that's great. Um, and what I love about this time, which is a film, um, it seems like a, an independent film, the kind of films that Hollywood used to make uh, before streaming, before um HBO, really, it, it, it's, um, you know, that, that must have appealed to you when you first saw the script. How did you become involved as uh, the the actor? You play Red, who's sort of a, I think, crotchety. Is that the right word? Crotchety, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Alcoholic, very bitter Vietnam veteran. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Working, uh, driving a hearse. Um, well, the... Rob and I talk all the time because we're such good friends. And yeah. um, so I knew when he was developing the script and, and then I helped him develop it and we worked on it together from early on. So, I mean, I, you know, it's, I've been part of the project since its inception and uh, uh, you know, and he, he has become a very accomplished director. He's done a lot of great stuff and I'm really proud of him for that. He's uh He's a really talented guy. He's also a, an excellent writer. So, um, you know, I was involved early on with it, and uh, he told me about this part. And as I, I helped him develop the script a little bit, we kept steering it more and more into the, the more crotchety realm. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun for me. <laughs> I bet. I really played a lot of parts like that. And, uh, and Rob was very good at directing actors as well. He was really helpful kind of guiding me through that performance. Well, I'm, I'm sure he didn't have to guide you very, very much, but you, you're teamed with a young uh, actress, um, Anwen O'Driscoll, who plays yeah. Grace. And uh, uh, this is a fascinating story, uh, very multi-layered, very modern. And um, in, in, in a lot of issues here that are very much um, at play these days, um, you know, uh, issues, um, LGBTQ, I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the initials all the time, but, you know, it, it looks at issues uh, and, and characters that are gay and, and trans. Um, and, and, and so it's a road movie with this uh, amazing new twist, right? Yeah, exactly. It is a road movie with that twist. And it's uh, and it's also... Uh... It, it, it works on a number of, of layers. You know, Rob always talks about it being about allyship, and and he, he's right in that we, you know, it's we're all 
in the same boat, all humans. We're all dealing with something, but but to the support from each other that we need is a very important point that the movie makes. Uh, the support that Red gets from uh, Blue, from the Deborah Cox character, who's yeah. uh, you know, to try to get him to turn his life around, and then and in many ways, um, Grace helps Red turn his life around and vice versa. It's all of these unlikely people coming together uh, as allies. And that's uh, it's a really important point. Had you made a road picture before? I mean, this is a genre that goes back to uh, Frank Capra and, uh, you know, Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, right? It's uh, yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. I'm sure I have. I I can't think, <laughs> but I've done so much. I I'm sure I must have. I, I've never. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've directed one. Mm. Hey, it's hard now. I can't. I can't call anything to mind immediately. I mean, I did do. I did direct a, f- a four-hour miniseries about Mark Twain as a young man, and he yeah, he, that, he, uh, called roughing it. Yeah, and, that, uh, who started in that? It was. Uh... Big, well, we had a lot of good actors in right, it. Wasn't uh, it? Uh, Robin Sun was the yeah. young Mark Twain. And yeah. he's in also because he and I became friends. And then I introduced him to Rob Vaughn. And uh, all of my friends all seemed to become friends with each other at some point. Um, but that was uh, Mark Twain on the road going from, um, you know, the Mississippi all the way out to California. And uh uh, you know, it was stagecoaches, so it was a different kind of road picture, but still, it was uh, that was a great project. Yeah, I had Jim Garner playing uh, Mark Twain. The great James Garner, yes, my God. I mean, you must have a, a James Garner story you could share. <laughs> well, many of them. We we did three or four shows together. Wow. And it was a pleasure to direct. He was a real, he was a real gentleman. I bet. Ken Tankers too, since you brought that word up, he had right. that, he had that side, but he was entitled to it. I felt. Yeah. Um, oh no, he earned it for sure. Good for him. Yeah, he was a, a wonderful actor to work with. He was, uh, he was a real pro. Well, let me take you back earlier then, just to see where this all starts. I know you're from Van Nuys. Is that your? I was born in Van. My dad worked in the film business, so yeah, he lived- as an animator, right? Yeah, exactly. and, and your uncle, Paul J. Smith, quite, I mean, I, I mentioned I collect film. I have a bunch of cartoons and uh, he worked everywhere. I mean, he goes back to Disney at the beginning and, and he worked for Harmonizing. He worked for, uh, you know, but he was the principal director at Lance in the 50s and 60s made and, and had a and he captured the way to use limited animation in a very funny way. Like he really had a knack for that in those yeah. later Warner, uh, Walter Lance cartoons. Uh, so did you grow up watching a lot of cartoons? <laughs> I did. I mean, yeah. could my dad, um, my uncle Paul was the oldest of the four brothers, Smith brothers that ended up working in the cartoon business. Wow. He'd come out to work with Disney. And then when my dad turned 18, which I think was around 1930, he bummed freight trains and came out from Michigan to come to Hollywood and found, you know, looked up his older brother. And then Paul got my dad. I think by that time, Paul had left Disney and was working with Schlesinger and then, you know, harmonizing. He got my dad started in the business. Wow. So they, uh, and my dad worked at various different places and, and Paul ended up at Walter Lance. And um, then the youngest brother, Hank, finally came out and they got him started also. They were all very, very talented artists. The fourth brother, uh, William, Bill was uh, worked in the animation business a little bit, but he didn't really like it. He was a scu- became a sculptor. Wow. And very successful, had many galleries and, you know, his pieces shown all over but it's fascinating to me that these guys spanned, you know, they started in very classical cell animation and then they had to make this transition to this quick TV animation. And uh, they and your uncle in particular did that with great skill. And he must he worked with guys like Tex Avery, right? Like he must have. Or all of those guys, all of those guys. Yeah. And um, they all knew each other, all the animators. Yeah. And, and actually, in my father. Frank worked um, 
after he after he worked at Fleischer for a while, they did the feature film of Gulliver's Travel. Oh my goodness! Wow. And then he did. He worked with. Uh, uh, he did Popeye cartoons, and he did the very last Betty Boop cartoon. Oh. And then, um, then he left, and he went to a studio called UPA. Did oh you, yeah, yes, you, absolutely. Gerald hey, McBoing Boing, yeah, yeah, Gerald McBoing Boing, which my father was an animator on, and they wow, were, wow. Yeah. He, I remember that as a kid, and we were very proud of my dad. You know, animating an Oscar-winning movie. Well, yeah. Uh, so I'm talking about Paul Smith, but your dad really—that was where it all changed. Uh, so hats well, off UPA, to him. Yeah, UPA definitely. Um, they kind of ushered in the era of limited animation, but they did it in such an artistic and creative way. Yeah. And as a little kid, you know, we grew up around, by that time, my dad was working with Bill Melendez and doing all the Charlie Brown. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by all of this. Um, but it's just, to me, it, it, it seems Fascinating to grow up in Van Nuys. You literally could walk to some of these studios, you know. And then- well, it'd be a long walk, but um, <laughs> you know, they were all in Hollywood. Uh, I think UPA was actually right near where Warner, right Warner Brothers, right okay. across. The so it's Bur- Burbank, so, yeah, yeah. So Burbank or Studio City or whatever. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had. My dad wanted to have a little bigger piece of property and, and so on. But, you know, when when I was three, he got offered a job running a um, animation studio in Paris. So we left Van Nuys for Paris, and I lived in France as a young boy for almost four years and uh, went to public school and <laughs> spoke French. My brother and I both did. We were, uh, yeah, we were working in, in Europe. And That's... then my dad came, came back. He was going to take a job in London, but he was getting so many more offers to work back in Hollywood that we ended up moving back to Hollywood. And then I proceeded to continue growing up in um, Northridge. Wow. Um, So, yeah, this all is coming together. Charles, you, you were almost groomed to arrive in Canada at one point, learning French at a young age. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, but did, did, my what, father. My father's family was from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Oh, and yeah. My, my grandmother is Canadian. Oh, fantastic. So, okay. Well, there you, there you and go. I felt very, when I first went to Canada, I felt very much at home there. There was a whole bunch of people that just talked like my relatives, you know. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we'll get to that. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Charles Martin Smith. <laughs> What's new this month on Paramount Plus? Plenty, as usual, topped by the season three return of The Mayor of Kingstown. The tense drama stars Jeremy Renner as Mayor Mike McCluskey. This season, the Russian mob is after him. Good luck, Russian mob. Not even getting crushed by a snowplow could stop this guy, Renner. The series was created by Canadian actor-musician Hugh Dillon, who returns as a podcast guest in June. Also this month on Paramount+, Plus, don't miss the documentary Cindy Lauper, Let the Canary Sing. She was always way better than Madonna, I say. Plus, she sang the Pee Wee's Playhouse theme song my goodness anyway learn all about her meteoric rise to fame in the 1980s Ah, i remember it well plus for something really different look out for my son jeffrey the dahmer family tapes this delicious uh, this documentary features recordings between serial killer jeffrey dahmer and his father lionel finally transformers earth park The original season two premiere is coming up, and here's a chance we get to meet a new generation of Transformer robots, the first to be born on Earth. Weird Al Yankovic and Red Hot Chili Peppers bassist Flea are among the guest stars. And remember, there's a mountain of entertainment on Paramount+. Plus. (laughs) 
And we're back with Charles Martin Smith. But while growing up in California, though, was acting something that you were fascinated by that you saw yourself doing? And, 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 and when, when did you first get involved as an actor? I always was fascinated by it. It was a kid, you know? Yeah. We did typical things, putting on plays in the backyard and forcing our parents to endure these things. But that's all we ever did. And in school, I always wanted to be in plays. And I couldn't wait to get to junior high and high school that had drama departments and I could act. I just always loved it. I don't, I'm not sure why. Always well, you, you probably grew up, uh, maybe this is just before you, but you probably wanted to be in the Mickey Mouse Club, right? Or be on Leave it to Beaver. This must have been your first memory. Oh, I, right? didn't, I didn't want to be a professional actor when I was a little, when I was okay. a kid. Hmm. I think I was pretty cute. I, <laughs> there you go. And, and, you know, a bit precocious, probably. And my, and my mother said that we had people suggesting, oh, you should put Charlie in the movies. But she didn't think that was a good life for a kid. And uh, no, but I went to high school and did all the high school plays. And, and the, it's very organized in Los Angeles. There yeah, are yeah. competitions and one-act festivals and all that. And I knew there were a couple of kids that were in my high school class who had professional acting backgrounds and stuff yeah. so and there and some parents who were actors and uh you know i think as a kid i'd always wanted to be an animator like my dad but i can't draw that's a drawback yeah <laughs> i guess <laughs> <laughs> um, deck against you yeah um the first credit i see when i look on your long list of uh acting and directing and writing credits is for the Brady Bunch, for the, I guess, the final season. Do you have memories of doing that show? I do. It wasn't the first professional job. That okay. I had. Okay. What would when that I, have been? When I was in high school, we, we did the, you know, the, I did all the plays. And when I was a senior, our acting teacher, who was a wonderful acting teacher, invited a couple of agents to come to the thing they were both kind of small time agents but uh they were agents anyway and yeah. uh, one of them wanted to represent me so i um my cousin uncle paul's son took some photos of me in the backyard and i cost me twelve dollars to get some headshot <laughs> well, that's a lot of money yeah. back then well and in the yeah. first year he sent me on three interviews three auditions and by this time i'd started into cal state northridge i was going to college UCLA and then Cal State Northridge. And um, the, but the third audition, I got the part. And it was wow. a West, Western called The Culpepper Cattle Company. And it's a really interesting movie. Wow. I have to look that up. I'm not familiar with it. Who Who is in that? You know, it's a whole cast of great cowboy actors, including Bo Hopkins and uh, Jeffrey Lewis. Wow. Luke Askew. Billy Green Bush, Matt Clark. It's just a it, Hal Needham was the stunt coordinator. It's just a real who's who of the Westerns in those days. And um, I had two scenes. I was thrilled, you know. Yeah, I bet. Did you get to ride a horse for you? $500. It was amazing. <laughs> That's and, uh, great. No, I, I drove a buckboard. Um, uh, drive, you know what a buckboard is. I was yeah. Drive, so. A horse on a buckboard race is how it started. And I uh, had no idea what I was doing. But um, <laughs> I came, came back from that. And um, that allowed me to join Screen Actors Guild. So when I came back from that, I got a couple of jobs early on. One of them was Brady Bunch. And another was Room 222, uh, a series that I have fond memories watching that. Do you remember doing, were you a student on that in that episode? Do you remember? That was a strange thing. Yeah. Uh, I did. Um, one of the things that I did in college with some friends is we put together 30 minutes of Marx Brothers material because they were Broadway plays, you know. Yeah. Called animal crackers yeah so, so we yeah we put together a bunch of these and we used to tour sort of play high schools and uh you know retirement homes and stuff and um i played harpo and my friend phil was a very good groucho my brother played brother dan played chico and um 
So there was a Room 222 episode where they were putting on a talent show. And we ended up getting hired to come and do our Marx Brothers act on uh, 222. I, I haven't seen it since then. I have no wow. idea. What, I know. The intersection Great. of the Marx Brothers and Room 222 and yourself, Great. you know, it, it, no, I know. it's, it's amazing. And it's weird, amazing. I've actually recently become friends now that I'm living out here in Palm Springs with Bill Marx. Oh, Harpo. the son of Harpo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I go to dinner and we hang out. He's a lovely man. And I will never in a million years admit to him that I put on a wig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to we gotta let the guy. I'm going to send him this podcast. Don't you dare. Um, that's amazing. And, and he himself could play the harp, right? He is uh, used to help score his dad's records and stuff, I think. Yeah, he helped arrange a lot of those yeah. things. But jazz pianist, he's primarily a piano guy. Wow, wow. Bill Marks, that's amazing. Um, there's a guy I'm always fascinated with. I ask people who worked at, at this juncture in, in television. Um, I don't know if you're, it's not listed in any of your credits, but did you ever audition for James Comack, who did uh, Courtship of Eddie's Father? And Yeah, we well, directed a lot of television. Yeah. Uh, um I never did. I never crossed paths with him. I certainly was aware of him, but I never, I never auditioned for any of the things he was directing or worked with him. Um, yeah, he, he an actor too, also on Broadway. Yeah, well, um, uh, damn Yankees, I think, right? And uh, he I was. Know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I'm. Uh, he, I, I've been covering TV for many years. I started in the. Uh, 1983 at TV Guide Canada in the art department. So Comac shows came before me, but I, I'm always a bit curious about uh, that show, uh, Courtship of Eddie's Father with Bill Bixby and stuff. Um, so, you know, you started with these TV credits and then American Graffiti. I mean, that's a movie I have to tell you, Charles, every time it comes on, I stop and watch it. You know, TCM, I've showed it recently and, uh, it's just an evergreen, right? You must be very proud of that film and must have uh, great stories about working on it. Yeah, I, I certainly am. Um, yeah, in that first year, after I got the Culpepper, I got another feature called Fuzz. Yeah. It was comedy with Burt Reynolds and Ewell Brenner and so on. And then I did a couple of the little television things. So in that first year, I had two films and uh, like three or four TV show credits. And then you know, I went to, uh, you know, went to an audition for American Graffiti and, and got that. I had actually taken a, a semester off of university with the money that I'd made that first year. And I went to England. Wow. And I kind of backpacked around the UK. I was there for about a month, I guess. And one of the things I wanted to do was go to Stratford and really soak up the Shakespeare and see some see some plays there at the Royal Shakespeare Company and stuff. I was always very interested in theater. And uh, so while I was gone, they were auditioning actors for American Graffiti, and I almost missed it. It was I, But I did get back in time, and my agent said, I don't know, I think they've cast this movie, but there's a lot of parts for young people. <laughs> so, uh, but I managed to get in there at the last minute and uh, and – get the part and it was a wonderful project to work on we believed in george completely and i bet it must have been interesting this is like his second film uh what was he like as a young director he's not the same as he is now he's very um he's very quiet and introverted mm -hmm. and uh, but there's still something about him that gave us all such confidence, not the least of which was that the script was so good. Mm, and yeah. He'd written it along with Gloria and Willard. And, um, but, uh, you know, if he could write something that good, plus he had Francis as an executive producer. On Francis it, Coppola, yeah. It was surrounded with really good people. And he had a reputation for being a really interesting young director to watch, you know, coming out of USC and stuff. Yeah. I think his short film version of THX 1138 won a lot of awards and got him a lot of notice. So 
but he was very quiet, very introverted. Um, but like I say, somehow just instilled a lot of confidence in all of us. And we, we'd have uh, walked over hot coals for that time. <laughs> um, I love when I watch American graffiti, when you see the uh, license plate THX there, it, uh, that's pretty hilarious. It took me a while to see that Easter egg, but uh, there it is. Um, and um, you got to tell me, it looked to me that one of the very first shots in the film is uh, your character toad affectionately known as toad um he's on a motor scooter and you drive right into a pop machine or something was this something you <laughs> intended to do or was that something in the script uh it was something in the script it was in the script but it wasn't exactly what i intended <laughs> it works man and i write a book about it all i'll tell the whole story of it but uh no i was i was supposed to uh bump into something uh on the bike it was scripted that i you know the thing lurches and comes to that i don't know yeah. how to run. and we did about four takes of that drive-in but on one take the bike got away from me and hit the trash can. <laughs> i was trying to do something funny but that wasn't exactly what i was aiming at but you know i figured well george probably liked that now, there were a lot of things that went wrong in the movie, uh, you know, mistakes that would happen within a scene. And he loved them and he put them almost all in the finished film. Well, it really, really works. Uh, yeah. That scene tick tickles me every time. The other one is at the liquor store where <laughs> Toad is trying to buy the booze and the owner comes out and fires the loudest gun I've ever heard. Uh, boy, that's a funny scene. Uh, well, like I said, really good writing. I mean, yeah. that's all the script. I remember when I was only 18, but I, I knew wow. what I was. You know, I had been in, I was, uh, I started university when I was 16. So I had two years of, you know. Wow. Wow. Main stage credits and, you know, some really good acting teachers. And I, you know, I knew some stuff. And um, when I read that, I remember sitting and reading that script and thinking, this is really good writing. Yeah. This is just so well written interesting characters toad had some great dialogue really some really good lines can you still do can you still do the dialogue when you're ordering the uh the booze at the counter no i no, i can't <laughs> <laughs> I've learned it's gotten too many lines over yeah 52 years now yeah no kidding my god um and, uh, the, you know, your co-stars, obviously, Cindy Williams and uh, Harrison Ford's in that movie. But, uh, you know, uh, you've got Opie. You've got uh, Ronnie, Ron Howard. And it's, uh, from what I understand or read, uh, you guys kept in touch. You, you continued to associate with uh, Ron Howard. He did a couple of films after that. And you're in them, right? Yeah. Ron and I, we were, of all of those people, when we all kind of maintained friendship. And so on. I still talk to Candy Clark fairly regularly. And, She's great uh, in the film. Yeah, she is great. She's great. And uh, she hasn't changed. Um, but Ron and I really did become good friends. And we used to hang out and do all sorts of things. And I was a, I was a groomsman at his wedding. Wow. Uh, and yeah, we used to. We've become really good friends. And we're still in touch. We still talk and get together for dinner sometimes. Every now and again, try to take in a Dodger game. Nice. We were all we used to go to the ball game a lot when we were kids. So, yeah. And, you know, Ron always wanted to be a director. That was all he ever really wanted to do. Well, it he, seems to, it seems to have worked out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm dying to see this, uh, the new um, Muppet uh, 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 documentary he's got on. Uh, I love that he's doing these documentaries and stuff. Yeah, because yeah. He's, got, he's got the financial ability to do it. And yeah. documentaries don't normally, you know, make a lot of money, but... Uh, imagined is in a position where they can finance these things. And so Ron is doing them. And that's yeah. Really, his really Beatles, fun. his Beatles one was really great too. Um, yeah. Now uh, just uh, one thing also about um, the director of uh, American graffiti there. Um, you, uh, I understand auditioned for his next film. Is this true that you tried oh, yeah. out? Yeah. So the, when your part you went out for was uh, Luke Skywalker, right? Well, he asked me to. That's great. Asked me if I would. Uh, while we were shooting American Graffiti, he talked a lot about um, Star Wars, and he was writing it, and he talked about the characters and all that. So when the movie was finished and he was doing screen tests for 
um, for people for Star Wars. He asked me to do a test for Luke Skywalker. He asked Cindy to do a test for the princess. Wow. And then he asked Harrison to do a screen test for Han Solo. So the three of us, sure, we said, absolutely. We don't do anything for George. Although I didn't think I was right for the part. He needed, uh, I didn't think I would get it. I didn't think I was good casting for it. I wouldn't have cast myself. <laughs> I don't know. I could argue with you on that. I think you would no, have been good. No, it was a comic book. You know, George was, he was making a kind of a comic book and he needed handsome, you know, characters that looked like they just came off of a comic book page, you know, Prince Valiant and all that. And Mark, and we see, we all knew each other, all of the young actors at that time. I knew Mark Hamill. Huh. And when I heard that he was, I thought, oh, well, he's a good choice. He was so kind of handsome, and he looked like he just stepped out of a, uh, you know, out of a science fiction fantasy with the boyish haircut and a really good-looking guy and a really good actor and a really nice guy. I, uh, we, all, we all knew each other. But I thought, I don't have the... I don't have the looks to be Luke Skywalker. I didn't think I had the right look. You know, I think a lot of us would have related to you as Luke Skywalker, though. You know, it, it, there was something about the characters you were playing back then that uh, uh, were, uh, even though you, you often kind of nerdy, but still adventurous, you know, like there was some, you're wow. even in American graffiti. Toad gets pretty brave. You know, at some point, he there. he's pretty brave, and yeah. he he actually ends up winning the night. He's the only one that ends up getting the girl, really. Yeah, you know? that's true. Yeah, he's a, he's a great character, but uh, no, like I say, Star Wars was more of a kind of a comic book feel that George mm-hmm. wanted, or like the old um, Flash Gordon serials that they used to. Yes, have. yeah, he no, some really pretty people in there, and uh, uh, I thought Mark was great casting, much better than I would have been. Well, it worked out, that's for sure. Back in a moment with Charles. Well, what's new this month on Super Channel? Well, giddy up for the 11th season of When Calls the Heart, found exclusively in Canada on Super Channel Heart and Home. There are, of course, many burning questions from last season's shocking finale. School teacher Elizabeth, Erin Krakow, she's saddled up with her Mountie man, Nathan Grant, played by former Brio TV podcast guest, Kevin McGarry. Can these two ride off into the sunset and still manage parenting obstacles, huh? There are plenty of other obstacles to unravel as Hope Valley heads into the 1920s. Hardys and McGarry's can look forward to 12 new season 11 episodes. And don't forget, all 111 binge-worthy past episodes are available on Super Channel On Demand. Remember, Super Channel and all Canadian service is available via most cable providers across the country, as well as streaming live and on demand with Amazon Prime Video channels and Apple TV+. Plus. You can also check out Super Channel Plus, available now on the Roku platform in Canada. And back to the show. You went on, though, to uh, several great films here. The Buddy Holly story, um, you must have a Gary Busey story. Even I have a Gary Busey story. Um, have you? Yeah, he he came to Toronto, and um, I live uh, near Toronto, north of Toronto, about an hour. A little place called Orangeville. I know you've shot around here when you were doing oh, this yeah. time. Oh, yeah. And um, Busey was here, and I had my name tag on. I'm interviewing him, and he and uh, he looked at me, and he said, "Well, how do you what what do you pronounce your name?" And I, well, it's Bill Brio, and he goes, "Well, that's not right." And he he's he he was right, like it, it's a French name, so it should be pronounced Brio. And um, Busey goes, "You don't even pronounce your own name right. You don't even know who you are." <laughs> That was very unsettling to have Gary Busey tell me that. Um, 
But uh, please tell me a Gary Busey story from uh, the Buddy Holly story. You know, uh, I don't really have anything to say about Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pass on that. All right. Well, we'll, we'll give you that one. That's fine. Uh, well, let's move on. I mean, uh, there's so many places here that you, you've worked with. Uh, you, Sean Connery and Kevin Costner, De Niro, De Palma on The Untouchables. Uh, and he had a great role on that. Uh, you know, I mean, were you, did you, were you ever in a films like that where you're pitching yourself? Because, good Lord, I mean, that was a, a pretty killer lineup, right? Well, it was great. I am um, uh, Brian De Palma. Well, you know, he knew the films and stuff that I'd done. And he... I was actually sitting at a restaurant in Beverly Hills and huh. and he was there with Art Linson and I'd worked with Art Linson before he was the producer and Brian and Art were having lunch there and I had worked with Art Linson on a movie called Rafferty and the Gold Dust Twins with Alan Arkin. My goodness, the great Alan Arkin, right? Holy oh, smokes. Wow. What a, the man was just a treasure. Just yeah. absolutely. And a complete gentleman i i learned so much from him and had such admiration for that man and, and somebody else by the way who who had uh, a residence in canada he was in nova, nova scotia for oh. like 25 years right who can blame him <laughs> <laughs> who can blame him yeah right. was he around uh, cape breton island or something? that's right yeah very good i don't know what used to live yeah yeah amazing so, yeah so they came over to the table while i was at this restaurant and Art introduced me to Brian and they said, we're doing a movie, you know, it might be a part if you were going to be around this fall. I said, yeah, let me know. So uh, they ended up offering me the, the thing. I, I, I was surprised that it turned out as good as it did, though. I wasn't confident oh. while we were shooting. the Really? Oh, I was pretty confident while we were shooting American Graffiti that it was going to be really yeah. good. Yeah. And I felt that way about Starman, yeah. which was such a good script. No kidding. But Watchables had a lot of problems and had difficulty in the filming of it. And it went way over schedule and uh, in some parts. And uh, there was some, it was a, it was a tough show, but. Mm. And my memory of it, it was pretty episodic. Uh, yeah. And when, I, and when we wrapped filming, I still didn't know. Kind of is. Yeah. And the dialogue was so kind of flowery, you know, this very, kind of stylized way of yeah. wonderful for kind of for the period, you know, but it was, what, what was that great line of Elliot Ness? He says, I've, I've become what I beheld and I'm content that I have done right. Well, Thank goodness. That's a hell of a line, you know? Yeah. What do you do with that? And this full of that kind of writing, which I presume stemmed from David Mamet. And uh, then I, when we were in, when it was in post-production, rumors began to circulate around Hollywood that this was a really good movie. And I got started getting very excited and then saw some of it, little pieces of it that Brian showed me. And it really, and then when we first saw the full movie screened, I was blown away. It did, turned out. I had forgotten, Charles, that did, that was Mamet. Did he write the screenplay? He wrote the original screenplay. He wrote He, he doctored it? No, he wrote it. Oh, okay. All right. Wrote it. And then, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether the credits only read Mammoth. And there was another writer coming in doing revisions at some point, and we never knew who that was. Mm. I never knew. I'm, somebody must know, but it was not, it was uncredited revisions. And I'm not sure, might have, I wonder if it was Brian himself. I really don't know. Interesting. You've done your share of uh, uh, revisions and writing and uh, credited and uncredited, I imagine, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. When did that start, the writing part for you? Well, I got interested in that when I was in college. I was always interested in writing and st started d trying to do screenplays when I was you know, in my early 20s. Wow. Wrote two or three of them, as you do. They stick, stick them in a trunk and nothing ever happens. But I learned to write. My mother was a good writer. and She taught me some basic things about writing. And then I began taking directing classes, too, more than acting classes while I was at university. And studied. So I was studying writing and directing 
And uh, I thought that I would probably go into either academic theater because I studied theater history, too, and I had a great interest in that. Mm. I thought I might go into those things or I thought I might uh, go into the theater. That's one of the reasons I went to New York to, when I met up with Herschel and uh, we were going around because I wanted to see about maybe getting a career as a theater actor rather than a film actor. Wow. Um, now, you've worked with many directors. Was there... And we've, we've talked about a couple here, but were, were there some that you paid close attention to that you really uh, learned from when it was your turn to direct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I tried to pay close attention to most of them, but there were a few that I really learned a lot from. Uh, George Lucas, um, John Carpenter, when we did Starman. And I had already sort of, I was getting close to, uh, I'd done a little short film and some stuff. So I really wanted to learn from him, from Brian De Palma, absolutely. And probably most of all from Carol Ballard. Wow. Uh, Never Call a Wolf. Yes, and Derek. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah and that's that, that. Well, uh, let's talk about that movie. My goodness. This is a, a, a lead starring role for you. And I understand you uh, spent a lot of time in Alaska and the Yukon uh, working on this project. Uh, and as you mentioned, it was a real um, game changer for you, right? Yeah, it definitely was. Um, Carol Ballard, you know, was uh, new uh, George, George Lucas. Right. And Carol was part of that Bay area film community, Coppola and Lucas and Coppola had produced the Black Stallion, which was the first feature that Carol had done. He'd been doing documentaries and a couple of Oscars in there somewhere, I think. Yeah. This documentary film. And then he did The Black Stallion. And then I happened to bump into him and Caleb Deschanel, the cinematographer. And again, at a restaurant. We got more interesting. <laughs> wow. That was at the commissary at Universal Studios. And um, anyway, Carol offered me the, the part in Never Cry Wolf. And it was a fascinating experience. We filmed for five months the first year, and then went back a second year for four more months. So it was almost a year and a half of principal photography with basically me and a couple of Inuit guys and a bunch of wolves. Right. And now, without a script, we didn't really have a script. Carol, Carol's background was largely as a documentary filmmaker, and he he would just create these scenes and we would work on them together and we would just put together this long rambling thing. And the, the, yeah, he brought up different writers at different times to work on it, including Ken Kesey. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. Kesey came up to Skagway. Not, not the we person were... that jumps to mind when you're thinking oh. of Arctic uh, wolf film. <laughs> <laughs> he was Great. I mean, what an interesting, fascinating. Like that. <laughs> wrote long, I hope I have them somewhere in a box. He wrote these long dialogue scenes, most of which we didn't film. And they were so literary. They weren't really actable, <laughs> but they were <laughs> written. Uh, he came up and it was just, uh, there were days when, because Carol knew that I'd, begun writing also and he'd just come up to me in the morning and say yeah he was a pretty taciturn guy also too he would come up to me and say i think there's three funny things for the guy to do while he's watching a vault <laughs> okay so i'd come up with three pieces of business you know maybe uh standing on a cliff throwing paper airplanes was one idea i don't know and we would just shoot these vignettes there was almost no dialogue in the movie it was just a whole series of scenes. And in those days, of course, there were no cell phones and no real communication. So the studio and the producers didn't know where we were or what we were doing. And most of the scenes were shot MOS, you know, no sound. Right. The dailies would show up at Disney, long scenes of, they couldn't tell what was going on or what the movie was about. <laughs> So Carol really had free reign to do what he does best, and he did it beautifully. It's a great, great movie. It is. And, and you know, it's almost like the way uh, Chaplin would have made a movie. Uh, or you know, like you said, Yeah. Absolutely. It's very much the way, you know, film sort of started. Incredible. Um, out that way. And uh, Carol Ballard's a genius, and I learned so much. 
Yeah. Now, Plus uh, I was around for the editing. Wow. Um, so, and, 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 and how did it go with the wolves? I mean, you know, I mean, you're spending all this time with uh, animals in the wild, really, right? They, they were, well, they were movie wolves. They were trained, uh, trained raised in cap- captivity. But we couldn't really, you know, you just don't go up and pet them like dogs. <laughs> we had a very good animal training department. And, uh, and they looked after the wolves. We did a couple of other. We had some, we had a nightmare sequence, a dream sequence where I'm being chased by wolves. Wow. And we used German shepherds for that. Smart. Real wolves would kill me. Right. And, uh, but the one of the German shepherds bit me in the leg and I had to go get a toe <laughs> shot. <laughs> you know, the oh. stories about that movie go on and on and on. And it was... Uh, it was really remarkable, but I learned so much from Carol. And and also, I understand you got to know Farley Mowat, the author who uh, the book was uh, based on his book. Uh, what was your relationship with him? We got to know each other on the on the movie, and uh, he invited me to his place in Cape Breton, and uh, he and his wife Claire became, and I became really good friends, and we we used to. I'd go up there, and he uh, he wouldn't come to the U.S. anymore because he'd had a run-in with I don't know was it Ronald Reagan or something. <laughs> <laughs> Harley refused to set foot in that. I mean, what an amazing man! An amazing writer and interesting, very very yeah. principled guy. And we um, we were sitting in Cape Breton, one over copious amounts of vodka, and they had a place just out of, outside of Toronto, also you know, in uh, Port Hope. Oh, right. Yeah, just east of. Yeah, that's where their winter place would be. Okay. Wow. Claire didn't want to have winters at Breton Island. Plus, she liked to go shopping occasionally. Farley couldn't care less. But so <laughs> then for Claire, they would live in, in Port Hope in the winters and then Cape Breton in the summers. And, Amazing. But uh, we were sitting there one time having a, you know, and he gestured to his bookshelves full of his books and said, anyone you want. Take, I'll give it to you for a dollar if you want to try to make it into a movie. So uh, I did. I found, <laughs> Really? I read so many of his things. Yeah. And I took, um, he had a book of short stories called The Snow Walker. And I um, took one of the stories from there called Walk Well, My Brother. Yeah. And, and uh, then I also then kind of mixed in elements of a couple of other stories from the Snow Walker collection. And um, wrote the script, and then made the made the film, The Snow Walker, which we shot up in uh, up in the Arctic, probably in O two or O three, I think. Wow, uh, that's incredible! Like I've been to Yellowknife and uh, White Horse and Dawson City in oh, yeah. Yukon, and but um, you, you know these aren't the easiest places in for three or four or five months of the year to. Oh, no. Operate a camera. They freeze. <laughs> you know, like, they can freeze. Yeah. And then, uh, but then, you know, when they, when it warms up, the mosquitoes rise. <laughs> clouds that oh, from miles. No. They keep you alive. And you're begging for it to get cold again. No, that's, we, we did a lot of um, Never Cry Wolf outside of um, White Horse and Dawson. Yeah. But the Snow Walker I shot in, um, uh, we were outside of Churchill, then we went up to Nunavut, and we went. Oh my to, God! Wow. Yeah, we were up in Rankin Inlet, and that was a really that was a great experience. I had a wonderful time with that, and the female lead in it is a young Inuit woman. And we did uh, screen tests all over the Arctic of uh, to try to find that. And we ended up with uh, casting a, a young woman named Annabelle Pugatuk, and wow. she was brilliant in it. We had our world premiere at the Toronto Festival. I think it would have been in 03. Wow. And it's, um, no, that's a movie I'm very proud of. I'm not in it. I do, I wrote and directed. Well, you should be. And, and it's a movie that seems so modern. Like today, it would be very timely. Uh, all of the, there's so many different issues there with First Nations and uh, um, just the, the, conservation elements of it it was seemed to be very much ahead of its time right yeah i'm very proud of those times and of course that's what brought me up to canada and i ended up uh living in vancouver for many years 
Yeah. So it was this film. And then you stayed in Vancouver um, and worked. And it's ironic to me that you you grew up in Van Nuys. You grew up where television and movies are made. And then <laughs> Vancouver becomes a big production center. And, and there you are again, right in the middle of it. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. When I first went up there, there wasn't much going on in Vancouver. They could maybe do two or three films at a time. They didn't have the infrastructure or the crews or anything. Right. They had made, as a uh, Fred Skepsi, the Australian director, did Iceman. That shot around there. And then, oh, what's the one about the killing of Dorothy Stratton? Um, oh, yeah. Um, oh, uh, Star, Star 80. 80. Star 80, yeah. Mm -hmm. 80. That was shot in Vancouver. And McCabe and Mrs. Miller had been shot up there. And right around that time, uh, there were just two or three, but I got to know the film community out there and they said, great stuff happening in Vancouver. Come on up. And then I also was involved with the beginning of a, um, a Shakespeare in the park there. So I got my wish to do Shakespeare and to do more theater and got what, involved a lot with the, which the as an actor. Yeah. Which plays did you do? Um, the first season we did uh, midsummer night's dream as you like it. And Othello. Wow. And I, Iago and Othello. Nice. That, and that version of that is still going on. It's called The Bard on the Beach. And it's a <laughs> nice summer, title. summer Shakespeare Festival in Vancouver every year. That's amazing. Don't go away. We'll be right back with Charles Martin Smith. Well, time once again to speak with Emily Gagne from Hollywood Suite. Emily, what do you got for us this month? Well, Bill, I've got some incredible series. I know that we're known for movies, but we actually have series, if you didn't know. And there's some great ones coming this month, including uh, Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. Have you heard of this series, Bill? Mr. Bates versus the Post Office? Yes. No, yes. no what's it about? It's about uh, the UK fight with the postal workers and the government and Toby Jones stars in it. It's it's a really incredible true story. Um, and if you know anything about it, I think you'll enjoy it. But if you don't know anything, it's just an interesting true story that I think is really going to captivate you. So nothing to do with Norman Bates. Norman Bates is not in it. No. All right. No, good. No. Okay. This is a different Bates. Uh, gotcha. A little bit less killing, you know, nice. um, but still a lot of drama. And it, it's coming to us at uh, the end of May, May 28th. There's going to be like a two night premiere but you can also stream it if, if you're uh, more of that kind of person all right well another series what else you got yeah until i kill you is our other big series right now and it um is a world exclusive so you can't watch it anywhere else oh. it's a true true crime drama so if you're into that i think you're gonna love it i'm not gonna tell you anymore because i don't want to spoil it in case you know the true story but until i kill you uh, our viewers are loving it and i think potential viewers will love it too until i kill you wow I okay. know. worldwide exclusive on hollywood suite starting right now fantastic all right thanks emily thank you bill and we're back with charles martin smith well, just in terms of your your TV work, though, I know you know there was when when Vancouver did start to accelerate as a production hub, there was X Files and uh, American Productions, Fringe that that you were involved in, but a lot of Canadian stuff too. And you worked a lot with uh, Christopher Haddock on um, Da Vinci, right? Yeah, Haddock was great. I uh, I did yeah Da Vinci's Inquest, Da Vinci City Hall, and then his next series, which was called Intelligence. Yeah, I directed those and then acted in some of them yeah. Haddock was a creative guy and uh he brought me in on some projects i was always grateful for it's a, it was a lot starting to happen in in vancouver and but there, there have always been i suppose it's true in toronto too there's two businesses really one is servicing the american production right yeah and then the yeah. other one are canadian films and yeah. i was always more interested in doing Canadian films rather than working on the American, American shows. 
Well, you know, uh, thank you for, for jumping in there. They, uh, it's always been um, a bit of a struggle. You know, the Canadian market, all the artists and producers and everybody have to compete against these big budget American films and TV shows. They're made for a third of a quarter of the money. So it's doing a show on a Canadian dime is an art and uh, a tough one. So yeah. any, any time uh, a seasoned director, actor can help is a huge bonus. So uh, your very, efforts are appreciated. Yeah. I've been up there and uh, I worked with uh, a very interesting producer named Bill Vince, who became, we became great friends. And Bill and his um, business partner, Rob Merrily, who I'm still very good friends with, nice. they started Infinity and they started making Canadian films, but kind of aimed at the American market. And they did some really interesting things. Well, one of them was Air Bud. Uh, yeah, which heard. you directed. Yeah, no kidding. That was a hit. Good for you. I sold it to Disney. It became a huge hit. And then um, Bill did The Snow Walker, my, the Farley Mullet one that I directed. and uh, he, But he did all kinds of interesting films, not the least of which was Capote, which... Um, oh, uh, with... with uh, yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Wow. Won the Oscar for that. And people don't realize that's a Canadian film. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's incredible. It was produced by Bill Vince, and, uh, and he put the financing together, and it was all shot outside of Winnipeg. Yeah. He oh did a lot God. of really interesting things. And very sadly, Bill passed away um, at the age of 44. Oh, that's uh, sad. That is sad. Yeah. So, yeah. so young. Um, Anton was, uh, he kept working up until the end, but he is a very influential producer in Canadian film. Uh, Charles, you've been very generous with your time. I don't want to take up too much more of it. Just a couple last questions. I wanted to ask about uh, a, a, couple, a film in particular, Boris and Natasha, because I did a podcast with Dave Thomas, who's oh, in you? that. Yeah. And uh, Andrea Martin and Sally Keller on, Kellerman, um, a film you directed. Any memories of working on that one? Yeah. What uh, what stands out? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of memories. Um, uh, it was a very difficult show. There were a lot of there were a lot of problems coming from the producer and production. Mm. And uh, um, Dave and I became great friends, and he was great fun to work with. But the, I don't have particularly good memories about that experience. There were an awful lot of problems mm. and it largely came from the producer who was married to Sally Kellerman. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Never <laughs> say no more. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of craziness coming in. That was a tough show, but you know, my friendship with Dave survived. So it would be, good. it would be worth it just to be friends with Dave Thomas. I would think he's a, such a smart guy, right? funniest guy yeah and he is just such a good writer and such a talented man he is uh, love yeah. the guy yeah. that's great um all right well that was what i wanted to mention and um just trying to look through the list here this is your list goes on and on these people you've worked with is crazy um and, and just a sense of you know even going way back again we talked um about no deposit no return but I, I'm assuming some of that might have been shot on the Disney studio lot. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for a young guy who grew up in Van Nuys, that must have meant something, right? To, to go to those commissaries, to go to those studios, to be part of that culture. I loved all of that. I yeah. loved all of I'd been around it, you know, and with my dad, you know, I remember him. I think he brought us onto a lot or two while we were, my brother and I were young and, we used to hang around Hollywood a lot. And it was, uh, you know, in my dad's films would get screenings and we'd go on the lots and so on. And my uncle Paul, whom you referred to earlier, yeah, yeah. Um, he was a member of the Academy. So we used to go to Academy screenings. Oh, so nice. On. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, I was always around it. But for me to be the one working, to me to be the actor now that, you know, has my own trailer and I'm on the lot at warners or paramount yeah yeah it was it was a really fun time and it was it seemed like a simpler and easier time in the early 70s 
Uh, and I've still always enjoyed being on those old lots and kind of soaking up the history. I just can't imagine going to work on Dopey Drive and uh, Mickey Lane. And <laughs> it just it just seems so uh, fairy tale. It's fantastic. It is great. Um, and, you know, it doesn't change that much. Uh, that, that's a lot where they haven't really changed a whole a whole lot. And we did a um, we had a great time on that one with a we had a soundstage with a sodium screen. And what that was was like a weird it was a big cyclorama with a big weird orange lighting on it. And you you could then superimpose a background on it. It was the precursor to blue screen. Wow. Which or green screens or blue screens, which became used everywhere. Yeah. And, but Disney had the very first version of that with their sodium screens they invented. It was a, it was a very innovative company, I guess, thanks to Walt. Well, they must have used that for Mary Poppins or uh, films like that for the combination of animation and uh, live action, bed knobs and broomsticks and things. That's great. Sure. Yeah. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. <laughs> That's right. Um, okay. Well, any actor who just knocked you, you were awed by uh, when you were working or met or working with them? Oh, well, a few. David Niven. Um, definitely Alan Arkin. Yeah. I would just watch him and what a gentleman and what a wonderful actor. I don't know if you're familiar with The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Oh, yeah. It's a great film. It's I, breathtaking. I he should have won the Oscar. I, I'm sure he was nominated for it. I think he was really a, one of America's great, great actors. He's pretty damn good in the Kaminsky method, too. I mean, you know. Oh, was, I love that. I yeah. love the Kaminsky method. It was incredible. Yeah, you must hey, have. Him and Michael Douglas. I had done a, I remember Michael Douglas from doing a, a Streets of San Francisco. There's another guy that I really admired. It was Carl Malden. I got to. Oh, my him. God. Yeah. yeah. He was great. Wow. And Sean, we certainly, Sean Connery was one I really looked up to. Uh, so many of them. I worked with some interesting people. I got to interview Michael Douglas recently. He's on the uh, Franklin, the series about Benjamin Franklin that's on um, Apple TV uh, right now. And uh, he was awed by um, Carl Malden, <laughs> you know, like, he, sure, he yeah, as a young, young actor. Carl Malden uh, was a giant. Yeah, no kidding. Um, well, uh, uh, congrats again with this time. And, and let's talk a bit. I meant to go into some detail just quickly with uh, the young actress, just Anwen. Um, yeah. You know, you you uh, have this um, cantankerous uncle-daughter relationship in the movie with her. Um, what, um, what were your impressions with her? It seemed to me that she was pretty good, right? She was excellent. She yeah. was, and uh, uh, Rob Vaughn uh, graciously included me in casting uh, oh, for that. Nice. We saw her audition. We, there were some very good young actresses that that um, did screen tests for that, uh, but uh, she, she just really blew us away. She's awfully good. She's from Toronto, you know, some uh -huh. north, north part of Toronto somewhere. Um, and she's starting to work a lot. She's very, very talented. And she's a real sweetheart. And she's hilarious. We spend a lot of time sitting in the hearse just uh, making jokes. And, you know. <laughs> and very talented young actor. The the idea is that her parents run a funeral parlor. I understand that was shot in a funeral parlor. Like it was. <laughs> and, the only place you could, yeah. It wasn't like we had the budget to go building. <laughs> uh and yeah driving around in a hearse that was a that real was awesome um, and I Bob did such a good rob did a great job because you know the film was shot very quickly and for him to have directed and worked that fast and come up with something of such good quality he's really he's a really talented guy yeah hats off to him no this time it was filmed in and around brantford and cambridge if people are look pay close attention there's all kinds of local places there it's on super channel fuse it's on super channel on demand and it's been on all over the festivals too and doing well i understand some prizes we uh, really well, definitely yeah rob yeah. won a director and on one one some uh, uh an actress award it's been accepted to i don't know dozens of festivals it seems like 
do you think there's a little bit of toad in red? Like, I just think when he's sneaking the liquor in, <laughs> you know, when he's, when he's doing stuff like that, this that is, was, uh, that was great fun to shit. <laughs> and again, some really good dialogue. Um, yeah. Crazy business where uh, the woman says, do you let your daughter speak to you that way? And I say, yeah, I guess, you know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have any decency? And I say, no, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, really, it's good writing. It all starts with good writing, you know. No, that was great. That's great. Toad, Toad 50 years later. I yeah, it kind of could be, I guess. <laughs> Toad went to Vietnam and uh, Red's a Vietnam vet. So yeah, maybe uh, they got that in common. I assume you would have been too young to have uh, been drafted uh, back in the day. I wasn't. No, I I was. I turned eighteen in seventy uh, one. I guess it would have been, and the oh, war God. was still going. And there was a draft, and I had friends who were drafted. Um, but at that time, there was a lottery system, right? Uh, where each date of the year they put on a, like a ping pong ball and then draw them out randomly. So people that were born on you know, July 2nd or maybe August 15th, whatever, they they draft people in a random way. And my number just happened to be really, really low on this, or very high. Very high, right. Yeah, no, yeah. lucky. That's that, thank yeah. God. I was uh, pick, yeah, my birth date came out number 346 or something. So there was no chance that I was going to be drafted, but some of my friends uh, were. Not and, so uh, lucky. Yeah. Not so lucky, no. I uh, there was a, a film. Well, Bill Carter wrote for the New York Times for twenty six years, a TV columnist, and I've talked to Bill over the years, and he uh, he had a low number, so he was worried, and so he kept starving himself to basically get his weight under a certain level, you know, to avoid qualifying. I guess. Yeah, well, as a lot of people tried a lot of different things uh, at that point, and uh, including going to Canada. You know, a number of the really good actors that I met when I first went to Vancouver had been uh, American, uh, you know. Expatriates, yeah. Well, there you go. Charles, it's been really amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, are we going to see you in uh, more projects? Uh, or what, what's your schedule these days in terms of directing and writing? You've done so much. You know, I'm kind of largely retired, uh, mm-hmm. living out by Palm Springs now, uh, which I really enjoy. I used to come here for vacations all the time. And, and isn't that what you do? You work in the movie business for, 30, 50, for 53 years, and then you retire to Palm Springs. I guess you do, yeah. Live near the you know intersection of Frank Sinatra and Bob Hope and you know every, everything out here. It's full of people from the film business. Like I mentioned, getting to know Bill Marks. It's, uh, it's uh, wow. very comfortable. That Plus, is. it's full of Canadians, by the way. Plus, it's which? Full of Canadians. Oh, in Palm winter. Springs. Well, yeah, I mean, it's warm. Winter. You see more Alberta and uh, BC plates on cars driving around than you see California, all the snowbirds coming down. Sure. If, if, you're, if you live in Winnipeg, you want to be in Palm Springs, I think. That's... You want to be in Palm Springs. <laughs> <laughs> You'll yeah, trade the over. palm trees for the cedars, for sure. I am. Um, so, I've kind of largely retired. I don't really want to work anymore much i do a little bit i just actually finished an acting job in a short film with um from a story by and produced by george rr R. martin wow lord of the rings my goodness what's this project game of thrones yeah game of thrones i'm sorry boy that's right. a terrible mistake i apologize to all the all right. game yeah. of thrones fans out there yikes it's an interesting short film that he had worked for years um which I didn't know as a TV writer. And this is when he was a staff writer for the reboot of the twilight zone. This was a story that he'd come up with. So now many years later, we we did a little short film of it, which we shot in New Mexico. I just wrapped filming on that about two weeks, wow. two weeks ago. Uh, and I'm sure I'll work with Rob Vaughn, and, but I, I, I'm not interested in working unless it's with, Close friends. Yeah. Why not? That's the way to go. I mean, stop yeah. me if, if I'm wrong here, Charles, but did you not actually do an episode of the reboot of the Twilight Zone? I did. I did. <laughs> was that I did. in Vancouver? I don't think so. No, that was shot in L.A. Okay. Um, I, did, uh, I did a Ray Bradbury 
thing, which was not a Twilight Zone. It was a Ray Bradbury story in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's right. They shot here. Yeah. Peter O'Toole. It oh, my basically God. basically a two-hander with myself. Talk about other legendary, wonderful actors that I got. What? To work with. You did a yeah, two-hander with Peter O'Toole? Yeah, me and Peter O'Toole. Uh, he was great. He was a, a lovely guy. Um, then, but the one I did with The Twilight Zone, we shot in L.A. And that, I was working with Martin Landau, another. Oh, my God. Look. Mission Impossible, yeah. Sure. Um, he goes all the way back to North by Northwest. You know, he's one of the best. Oh, guys. yeah. He's absolutely these fantastic yeah. Martin Lando. I did get a chance to interview him out in one of the did TCA you? press. Yeah. Well, you know, I go down to the TCA, the television critic press tours in Pasadena every six months. I yeah. used to work for the Toronto Sun and Canadian press. And uh, Lando, PBS would honor pioneers of television. And they had him and uh, Robert Conrad and Ohura uh, from Star Trek. And, oh, oh my, wow. you know, I, yeah, Nichelle yeah. Nichols and uh, I think Red Buttons. Anyway, it was just uh, always quite a thrill to to see those people and get a chance to speak to them for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, nothing compared to your adventures. So please write that book. You mentioned you might do that. I hope you're sincere. I've got a little spare time on my hands and I, uh, and I'm, I'm starting to work on it. Oh, I think that's, I'm, I'll be first in line. Let's talk again when the book's published, please. Yeah. And uh, I really appreciate your time today, Charles, really lovely to meet you and uh, congratulations on an incredible career as a, actor director writer and uh wow it's just uh, a, a wonderful story thanks so much appreciate it it's been a pleasure okay. talking yeah thanks. you too all right thanks a lot charles Well, first of all, I want to thank director Robert Vaughn, who I spoke with a couple of years ago on this podcast, for setting up this conversation with his friend and lead actor, Charles Martin Smith. Thanks, as always, to Phil Hong, who, like Charles Martin Smith, does it all when it comes to editing and storytelling. Always grateful to Phil. Um, I'm also very grateful to B.J. Del Conte, Paul Boudreau, and the Crispy Critters, as well as piano man Steve Dudley, for all the music that's heard on these episodes. Finally, thanks to you, listener. If you liked what you heard, spread the word. I'm Bill Brio. Thanks for listening.